So, once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow have survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP4365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is a star that has burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. One of those zombie stars used to be a white dwarf, or just left over from an explosion. It gobbled up too much from another star and, surprisingly, managed to explode once again. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. In outer space, you'd be strong enough to weld two pieces of metal together with your own hands. Okay, it has nothing to do with your strength. You could just press them together with no effort, and that's it. Oxygen in our atmosphere makes a thin layer on the surface of the metal. It's like a barrier, which is why such a trick is impossible on Earth, but perfectly logical in outer space. If you ever go to space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. Yeah, small comfort, huh? If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around your eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, there's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space. If the fire breaks out in a rocket, you can simply turn off the ventilation system and voila! It can get more complicated if there's intense smoke sparking and material melting in conditions of reduced gravity. Regular foam fire extinguishers we use on Earth are useless here because they release foam randomly. Researchers are developing a fire extinguisher that will put out fires by using sound waves. The bigger the sound intensity, the bigger the flame they can put out. But the astronauts might end up deaf if their frequency is too high. A black hole is not like some starving monster that wanders around and has gravity so strong nothing can really escape it. When something comes close to the point of no return, which we also call the event horizon, it disappears. No way back. But quantum physics claims nothing can really destroy data. So it's a true paradox. Stephen Hawking was the one with the idea of how black holes don't really have event horizons. Maybe they have apparent horizons. Those trap things for some time only. After that, the trapped energy will somehow get away, but in a different form. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. It happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time squeeze it in another. Like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like 4 billion suns, but luckily it's far away from us. There are more than 23,000 pieces of so-called space junk bigger than a softball floating above our planet at speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. Woo! And there are 500,000 pieces in general, some of them the size of a marble. Space waste is generally debris made up of natural particles called meteoroids and artificial particles, like things we make on the Earth. Meteoroids orbit the Sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world, from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. 
Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. There's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the rest of the 70% of the universe. Scientists don't know much about it, but they think dark energy could be behind the increasing expansion of the entire universe, while dark matter slows it down. Dark matter doesn't interact with us in any way that we know of, nor does it interact with itself. If it did, we might be able to find dark matter galaxies, dark matter planets, or such objects. Now, astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bit bored and wanted to check out how things were going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the cosmic microwave background map, or in short, CMB. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. But instead of CMB, they realized there's a giant area way colder than they'd expected. The team started tracking radio signals, but there were no radio sources in that whole volume. That means there are no galaxies or clusters, and since it's so cold, there's no dark matter either, or regular matter, so it really doesn't matter. The giant void is empty, and researchers think it could consist of dark energy. Light can still pass through it. It's not the only void in space, but it's the biggest one we've found. The area around a star is habitable when it's not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on the planet surrounding it. Let's say our planet was where Pluto is. It's too far from the sun, which means our ocean and big parts of its atmosphere would freeze. But if the Earth was in Mercury's place, we'd be too close to the Sun, and the water on our planet would evaporate. Such habitable area is called the Goldilocks Zone. So you can see where planets are located and assume if they have a chance for life on their surface. But Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, definitely breaks the rule. It's outside of the Goldilocks Zone, but still kept warm. Not from the Sun directly, but Jupiter and its moons that actually pump energy into Europa. Europa changes its shape as it circles around Jupiter. It's similar to tides rising and falling on our planet. Water on the Earth changes its shape as a response to the tidal forces of our moon. When the same happens with a solid object, the object is stressed. That's how you pump energy into that object. It's like you're playing racquetball. You hit the ball around a couple of times before you start playing like you're warming it up. You kind of distort the ball every time you smack it. The surface of Europa is frozen, but it has cracks in the ice. You can see ridges in the ice where there's a crack. Then those flying chunks shift and refreeze. You'd see a similar thing if you could fly over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime. There are ice sheets constantly breaking and refreezing. So Europa can't completely freeze. Scientists think there could be an ocean of liquid water under the icy surface. Europa is not the only moon where this is happening. Another of Jupiter's moons, Io, is also warm because of such tidal forces. Io also has volcanoes erupting from within all the time. So it's not only that the Sun warms the space bodies and pumps them with energy. Many experts agree the universe might come to its end about 3 to 22 billion years from now. It's expanding all the time, which means it formed from a compact state. If it has a beginning, it's probably going to have an end as well. Yeah, I won't be around for that. One of the popular theories says the growth will slow down, and gravity will become the powerful force that will make the universe shrink. That will lead to complete chaos. Galaxies, stars, planets, space bodies, they will all move, collide, and, you know, destroy one another. It's like the reverse Big Bang. Huge chaos, but this time, everything collapses. Well, on that cheery note, always stay on the bright side of life. Now, I don't want to spook you, but there's a chance that our entire Milky Way galaxy is located in the so-called space void. It's a region where there's relatively little matter compared to other corners of the known universe, and it's much less dense than it is elsewhere in the universe. 
In other words, we might exist in an air bubble in a cake. If that's true, it would mean that we're even lonelier than we thought. Hmm. In our universe, all the galaxies are constantly moving away from each other. In order to understand how far they move away, scientists use something called the hubble lemaitre constant. It's like a speedometer, but for galaxies. However, there's a cosmic mystery called the Hubble tension. It's challenging what we know about the universe's expansion. Scientists used to consider the Hubble Lemaitre constant a reliable guide, but our recent observations question this reliability. The speeds we see in real life don't match up with the distances we calculated and expected. They aren't sure why these measurements don't add up. Researchers followed the moves of supernovas and saw that the universe seems to expand faster around us than it does overall, as if it's actively avoiding us specifically. Hmm. After considering this, they began to assume that we might all live in a cosmic void. Cosmic voids are vast, empty spaces between galaxies, kind of like between my ears. They make our entire world look like a big sponge. Now, let's go back to the beginning, just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Right after the beginning of everything, the universe was a hot, compressed plasma. It only had very tiny variations in density, called quantum fluctuations. After the Big Bang, the universe began to expand. Those quantum fluctuations grew together with it, creating regions of varying matter density. Because of that, the universe didn't expand everywhere uniformly. Instead, little claps of matter began to gather together over a long period of time, creating massive structures, galaxies. Galaxies are arranged in huge walls and filaments with enormous gaps in between. And these gaps are voids, also known as dark space. Now, these voids aren't truly empty. In fact, they actually hold more than 15% of the amount of matter found on average throughout the entire universe. They still contain gas, dust, dark matter, and even stars and galaxies. However, they have less density than regions with galaxies, about a tenth of the average matter density, which is why we consider them nearly empty. Usually, they'll have a diameter ranging from about 30 to 300 million light years. That is an enormous distance, even on a space scale. For comparison, most planets and nebulas we've found so far have a distance of hundreds and rarely thousands of light years away from us. In the case of voids, if you were in the middle of one, it would just look like seemingly eternal darkness. The closest stars would be so far away that they would be almost invisible to you. Some of them are especially large. They're known as supervoids. The largest known one was creatively named Giant Void. Ooh. It's so big, it's impossible for us to even imagine. 1.5 billion light years away, with a diameter of 1 to 1.3 billion light years. Yeah, it's basically a big dark vacuum. But even this giant vacuum isn't entirely empty. The giant void houses 17 separate galaxy clusters within its expanse. However, it might not be the biggest emptiness in our universe. There's this thing called the CMB cold spot. It's this unusually large and chilly area of our universe that we saw through the microwaves. It really stood out on the map of our universe with its unexpectedly low temperatures, and scientists have spent many years trying to figure out what the thing is. In 2015, scientists proposed that this place might be a supervoid, and probably the largest one ever. Being even more original than this one, they called it the Great Void. If it's true, this place would be an emptiness of about 1.8 billion light years in diameter, about a thousand times larger than typical voids. Not everyone thinks that's possible, so scientists keep arguing over this one. There's another interesting theory going about this place. One researcher suggested that this place might have been a trace on our collision with a parallel world. It's a pretty bold hypothesis, but unfortunately, there's no way for us to confirm or deny it with our current technologies. In any case, as the universe expands, these voids will grow, and the walls connecting galaxy clusters will stretch and break. Eventually, the voids will merge, leaving gravitationally bound galaxy clusters as islands in the expanding emptiness. In other words, sooner or later, the great emptiness will consume everything in our world.
So, it turns out, we might be a rare occasion in a supervoid, one of the 15% of matter. This would explain why we're surrounded by relatively few galaxies. This discovery, if true, challenges the standard model of cosmology, which we created with Albert Einstein's help. It would mean that gravity in general behaves differently than what we expected. According to the standard model, such a significant underdensity shouldn't exist. Because of that, scientists will have to explore and consider this idea thoroughly. It might just challenge our very basic understanding of physics. The scientists call this the local hole. The discovery of the local hole may hold clues to explaining the Fermi paradox. Maybe in this specific part of the universe, where we hang out, the chance of intelligent life developing anywhere nearby is very low. Perhaps all of the sentient beings hang out somewhere beyond our supervoid. But that doesn't mean we should lose hope, or that life anywhere nearby is impossible. In fact, life in the universe might be much more common than we previously thought. We know that the inner planets, like Mercury and Venus, are inhospitable due to extreme conditions. However, Venus looks interesting because, even though it's a crazy toxic planet, scientists believe that it was very Earth-like in the past. It could have even hosted life. Unfortunately, it was too close to the Sun and all the nice conditions evaporated over time. But there's a possibility of microbial life surviving in its high-altitude clouds. Mars, a cold desert, also might have been a friendlier place in the past with rivers and lakes. Though now it lacks a protective atmosphere, ancient life might have existed there. In that case, it would leave potential fossils and underground microbes could still survive. We've discovered some signs of them, but are still debating whether this stuff was truly organic or not. The gas giants, like Jupiter and Saturn, and ice giants are not ideal for life. But their moons offer hope. Europa has an ocean beneath its icy surface, making it a potential hotspot. Encephalus releases water into space, carrying complex molecules that hint at interesting possibilities. And Titan is especially unique. It has liquid bodies on its surface, rivers and lakes of hydrocarbons. While its frigid temperatures aren't great for life, scientists ponder if it might host life with a different kind of chemistry. However, it will take us decades to check all these celestial bodies and study them properly. We haven't sent anything so far since the times of Voyager 2. But if we're lucky, we might explore our solar system during the 21st century. We might explore our solar system during the 21st century. In any case, there's a lot of potential for life even in our solar system alone. Not even mentioning all the planets and galaxies we found nearby. Our estimates suggest that the observable universe, the one we can see, might host around 5.3 trillion habitable worlds. One of the most likely candidates so far is Kepler-186f. It's a potential Earth-like planet, just 10% larger than Earth. This planet orbits a red dwarf star, which is a star a bit dimmer, colder, but more long-living than our Sun. And it's only about 490 light-years away, which may sound like a lot, but remember what distances we've discussed with supervoids. So even if we really are in a supervoid, we're still lucky to have many galaxies and planets around. And if one day, we'll find a way to travel through the universe, leaving the local hole probably wouldn't be a problem. The constellation Orion is the brightest one in the sky. Orion is also in the night sky during the winter months when it's dark for the most hours. This makes Orion the most recognizable constellation to almost everyone in the world. Most stars don't seem to move too much or change their positions in the sky. This is not because stars are static. It's because our Sun is moving along with them at about 483,000 miles per hour. It's a grand parade orbiting together around the Milky Way. The three stars that form the asterism, or star picture, of the belt of Orion have appeared in the same position for many thousands of years. There's a theory that the ancient Egyptians used the belt stars of Orion as a template for the placement of the three pyramids of Giza. The brightest star in Orion's belt is the middle one, called Alnilam. That's where the 481-foot-high Great Pyramid of Khufu was placed. To Khufu's west side, and in precise alignment with it, stands the 471-foot-tall Pyramid Khafre. 
That's exactly where the star Alnitak is directly aligned to the bright middle star of the belt. To Khufu's east side, where the dimmest star of Orion's belt, Mintaka, is slightly offline with the other two stars, is the smallest pyramid of the three. Menkare is 213 feet high and slightly offline from the other two pyramids. This one example serves to illustrate the profound impact that the constellation Orion has had on human history. Orion's heroic-sized figure inspired the ancient Greeks to create a tapestry-like story. It involves six other constellations spread across the winter, spring, and summer sky. Let's see what this story tells us. Orion is pictured as a hunter. Back then, hunting was a big deal. Hunters supplied food. So there's a lot attached to this constellation. The whole food chain, in fact. In the sky, Orion is in combat with the constellation Taurus the Bull. Except, Taurus is not really a bull, it's an auroch. Aurochs are extinct now, but they were once plentiful in Europe. Standing six feet tall at the shoulder with long pointed horns, aurochs were powerful and fearsome creatures. There's a cave in the country of Spain that is filled with gorgeous paintings of aurochs. These pictures date back to 15,000 years ago exquisitely drawn with inks that have not faded over the course of 150 centuries. The bulges in the rock stand out in three dimensions as the shoulder muscles of the aurochs. The constellation of Taurus, the auroch, is also in the cave, with the famous star clusters, the Pleiades, on its back, and the Hyades on its snout. The internet has a thrilling virtual tour of this Cave of the Bulls, full of aurochs. Maybe it should be renamed into the Cave of the Aurochs instead. Recently, the full DNA signature of an auroch was recovered from a well-preserved auroch skeleton. And scientists hope to breed these animals back into existence. Good luck and best wishes to this attempt to revive an extinct species. Aldebaran is the bright red giant star that marks the eye of Taurus. Bulls, when angry, always get this blood-in-the-eye look. Does it make you wonder why the bull's eye on a dartboard or archery target is always red? Hmm... Creeping up behind Orion is Leo the Lion. Lions don't just live in Africa in times long past. The Cave of the Bulls in Spain has a painting of Leo the Lion. Yep, these prehistoric people were drawing the constellations of the Zodiac. But that's another story for another time. Orion gets rid of both Taurus and Leo. And then the story gets interesting. Orion claims in his moment of triumph, I can defeat any animal I want. Orion's boast becomes the center of this sky drama when Gaia, or Earth, decides to get involved. Orion's words resounded throughout the world. This may be at the time in prehistory when civilization was changing from a nomadic hunter-gatherer tribal society to an agrarian society. The latter developed villages and towns 12,000 years ago. The human population was increasing and food supplies were diminishing. Something had to be done about Orion and all the hunters or social development would be stymied. Now enter Gaia into the story, but not into the sky. There is no constellation of Gaia in the sky. Gaia is Earth. Born parentless directly from the elemental chaos, Gaia was the feminine personification of our planet, and the word itself means soil. Brightsiders may be interested in a modern scientific theory that also personifies Earth as a living organism. It's called the Gaia Theory. It first appeared in the 1970s. The Gaia Theory presents Earth as a biosphere, as if it were alive. The theory claims that all components of the planet work together as one totally interconnected dynamic system. This is called symbiosis, or synergy. Together, they produce the ideal conditions for life. Life adapts to regulate the atmosphere at 21% oxygen, the salinity of the oceans at a maximum of 24.7%, and planetary temperatures at 57 degrees Fahrenheit. To illustrate how life adapts to maintain control of the changes in planetary temperatures, the authors of the Gaia theory created the fictional planet Daisy World. Daisy World is completely covered by white and black daisies. When the sun becomes too hot, the black daisies start disappearing, while the white daisies increase in population. The whiteness of these flowers reflects sunlight, and the planet cools down. If the sun isn't hot enough, the white daisies reduce their population, and the number of the black daisies grows. The black flowers absorb sunlight, and the planet warms up. This is Gaia at work. 
It's basically the same principle that created oxygen and produced the ozone layer in the atmosphere. This layer helps to block the harmful ultraviolet light from the sun. Scientists have been slow to accept the Gaia theory because of the lack of convincing evidence. But these days, we have self-learning AI supercomputers. They can probably make it possible to integrate Earth's biological and geological systems. This way, we might get a clear picture of how the planet functions as a self-sustaining biosphere. Huh, wouldn't that be something? Now we can go back to the story of Orion and see how Gaia took care of the problem Orion's boast created for the planet. Obviously, Gaia couldn't send animals fiercer than a lion or an auroch to subdue Orion. So Gaia went small. She chose a poisonous scorpion to do the job, and it did the job. In the summer, the constellation of the scorpion crawls at almost the same latitude as Orion's foot. The scorpion may be a small animal in the same arachnid family as spiders and ticks, but in the sky, Scorpius is the 33rd largest constellation out of the 88 of them. There is a general rule that the larger a constellation is, the longer ago it was created by early star watchers. They had their pick of stars, first come, first served. And so, they made large constellations first and little constellations later. By the way, if you were the first in line at a buffet dinner, wouldn't you take big helpings and let the end of the line have the scraps? Think chocolate cake. Oh, sure, I'll only take a little piece. Nah, I don't think so. In this story of Orion, we have a collection of large conspicuous constellations like Leo, Taurus, Orion, and Scorpius, which confirms the great age of the story. Three smaller constellations, Lepus the Hare, Canis Major, and Canis Minor, Orion's two hunting dogs, complete the Orion star tapestry and add an interesting subplot. What we have then is a fable of two different worldviews or cosmologies, that of Gaia and that of Orion. One is feminine and the other is classically masculine. One is committed to dominating the natural world, that's the Orion archetype. The other is committed to the survival of the planet against all circumstances, that's Gaia. The two may seem opposed, but perhaps they're meant to be complementary. Look, Orion and the Scorpion are on the opposite sides of the sky. One in the winter, the other in the summer. They act like two poles, north and south, of the same magnet, our planet. This is what we see happening these days. Science and technology are becoming more and more sensitive to the natural environment. Myriads of satellites are monitoring the biosphere of Earth. Gaia and Orion are starting to work together toward what the ancient Greeks called Kalokagathia, or harmony. That's what we call synergy and symbiosis these days. Let's keep that synergy going strong. Black holes are some of the most enigmatic and sinister phenomenon in the universe. They can swallow up entire stars and planets, bending the very fabric of space and time. But what if Earth, our home planet, were to be caught in the grip of a black hole's event horizon? Hmm. What would we see before the inevitable end? Well, let's have a look-see, okie dokie. So a black hole is like the bully on the playground. You avoid them at all costs. It's a region of space where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape it. It's like Houdini in reverse. As with snowflakes, every black hole is unique. Each one has its own mass, spin, and charge. And they also come in different sizes, sort of like jeans. Petite, slim, regular, and husky, or something. Anyway, there are four sizes. The smallest black holes are the stellar mass kind. They're born when the massive star runs out of juice and folds in on itself. They're like the chihuahuas of the black hole world. They may be tiny, but they're feisty. They gobble up nearby matter like a hungry puppy. And even the smallest one is three times more massive than our sun. Next up, we have the middle children of this cosmic family. Intermediate mass black holes. They're too big to be born out of collapsed stars. Scientists believe that they may be created when several black holes merge into one. And even though they can't dominate galaxies, at least they can swallow up some nearby stars. Goody for them, huh? But do you know who can dominate a galaxy? The enormous monsters of our universe, supermassive black holes. They're the giants with masses ranging from, hmm, millions to billions of times that of our sun. 
and they play a crucial role in the growth and formation of their host galaxies. Finally, there are ultra-massive black holes. Trust me, you can't even imagine the size and mass of these guys. These cosmic eldritch horrors are extremely rare, but the ones we know can devour entire galaxies like uh, Pac-Man. So, what happens if you get too close to a black hole? Or more like, what would you see in your last moments? Well, first, you reach an event horizon. It's like a point of no return, an invisible boundary that marks the edge of a black hole. And here's where things start to get really weird. For example, time starts to slow down. Not for you, for an outsider watching you from a safe distance. If you were falling into a black hole, you wouldn't feel any different. But if you were watching someone else fall into it, you'd see them slow down and eventually freeze in time, like in a paused video. As you get even closer, you would start to see some pretty mind-bending things. The gravity would cause the light around you to bend and distort, creating a sort of funhouse mirror effect. You might even see a halo of light around the black hole, known as the photon ring, or jets of high-energy particles spewing out from the black hole's poles. You can actually get pretty close to a black hole without feeling any major effects. It's only when you cross the event horizon that there's no going back. Your goose is cooked. After crossing this boundary, you'd be unable to see anything. For the person watching you from the outside, it would be as if you had suddenly disappeared. Meanwhile, you might start feeling a bit stretched out, like a piece of spaghetti. This is because the gravity is so stark that it's pulling you in different directions at once. There's even a scientific term for it called spaghettification. We'll cover linguinification in another video. Now that you're inside a black hole, you're taking aim at the singularity. It's a point of infinite density in its center, where all matter is crushed down to a single point. It's like trying to fit an elephant into a tiny matchbox. Everything gets squished together until it's as small as it can possibly be. Which means it's time to wave goodbye, I guess. And if all that sounds scary, here's another fun fact. Black holes are not rare at all. Actually, there's one in the center of each galaxy, including our own Milky Way. So, does it mean that we'll eventually be sucked into it? And if so, how exactly would it happen? Well, let's see. Imagine a black hole approaching our solar system. At first, it appears as nothing more than a tiny speck in the distance. But as it gets closer and closer, its gravitational pull begins to wreak havoc around. Planets start to veer off course. Asteroids are flung into oblivion, and comets are shattered into a million pieces. But just like waiting for the sauces to be served in a German restaurant, the worst is yet to come. Yeah, I like that joke. Soon, it inevitably reaches the Earth. First, our planet's atmosphere would be pulled toward the black hole, triggering a massive windstorm. And there would be huge waves on the oceans, the water itself being distorted by gravitational forces. Imagine seeing seas and oceans getting stretched out. Earth's magnetic field is generated by the motion of molten iron in the planet's core. But now, the extreme tidal forces of the black hole would disrupt this motion, causing the magnetic field to weaken and distort. All this would cause massive earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, as the planet's crust and mantle were pulled apart. All infrastructure and technology would be completely destroyed. Buildings, bridges, and roads would be torn apart. Okay, let's hit the pause button. Pretty horrifying, isn't it? Nah, but don't worry. You wouldn't have even seen that much. Because you would have felt the effects of the black hole much, much earlier. Well, back to the future. We'll lose our magnetic field even before everything started to collapse. And this means not only that the weather and climate will become terrible, we'll also be exposed to extreme radiation. These gamma rays and the heat from the black hole could drastically change our planet. Say ta-ta to all our beautiful nature. At least misery loves company. We won't be the only ones affected by a black hole, which is probably even worse. As this beast engulfed the entire solar system, it would consume about everything. One immediate effect would be the disruption of the orbits of asteroids, comets, and all the other bodies. 
the planets would begin to deform and stretch, their surfaces warping like molten metal. The Sun itself would be affected, its surface contorting like a glob of putty. And yeah, all this is scary even to imagine. But now, breathe and relax. Because none of this will ever happen. This is the bright side, remember? <laughs> Your infinitesimal odds of winning the big lottery are even better than the Earth ever being swept into a black hole. The nearest black hole to our solar system is called Gaia BH1. Discovered by scientists in 2022, it's found in our own Milky Way galaxy, about 1,600 light-years away from Earth. Gaia BH1 is about 10 times the mass of our Sun, which makes it a stellar mass black hole. It's not very interesting on its own, but its discovery has supplied valuable insights into the behavior of these cosmic monsters. But as you can see, even the closest known black hole is over a thousand light years away. They move very slowly, and they'll never get so close to our system to pose some kind of a threat. Hey, but didn't you say there's a black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy? Doesn't that mean it's going to eventually hoover up our entire galaxy, you may ask? Maybe not in that voice. Well, don't worry, the correct answer is no. The one in the center of our galaxy is called Sagittarius A star. You may remember it from that viral blurry photo that circled around the internet a few years ago. This black hole is indeed very massive and has a strong gravitational pull, like two 8th graders in love. However, it's still a small beam. It only affects objects that are close to it. The objects in the galaxy are all too big and move too fast to be pulled in by black holes. Nevertheless, they're still fascinating objects to study. Scientists are still trying to unlock the mysteries of black holes. And even though they'll never be dangerous to us, they're still a huge reminder of the incredible power of our universe. Now I think I'll turn my attention to the incredible power of chocolate. Our sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves, Jupiter like being underwater, and Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking! If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. 
their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40365. It's a partially burned white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine. But space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there, too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system. The South Pole Aiken Basin is as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. 
This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and... It's white! The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Astronomers have been asking one question for decades. Is space really as black as we think it is? Well, NASA's New Horizons space mission might have just given us the answer. After exploring Pluto, the spacecraft kept going and is now billions of miles away from Earth. This means it's far from all the light pollution we get from sources like the sun and dust particles around our planet. Scientists used the spacecraft's simple camera to take images of what looked like incredibly boring blank space, free of bright stars or anything else that could scatter light back into the camera. They then processed these images to remove all known sources of visible light. Once they'd removed the light from stars, plus scattered light from the Milky Way, they were left with light coming in from beyond our own galaxy. But here's the surprising part. They found that there was still plenty of unexplained light. In fact, it was about equal to all the light coming in from the known galaxies. That means there's just as much light outside of galaxies as inside them. So where does all this light come from? Well, it could be coming from sources we haven't yet discovered, like small faint dwarf galaxies or unknown phenomena out in the universe, or it could be associated with dark matter which is still a mystery to scientists. With this groundbreaking research, we can say that space isn't as dark as we know it. What if we take all the light from the stars and galaxies out there and throw in some gas and dust clouds? What color do we get? Beige. This leads us to another question. Do we still need the sun if our space is colorful? And the short answer is, yes we do. Yeah. The colors of space are a result of the interactions of light with different celestial objects, such as stars, galaxies, and gas clouds. While these colors are fascinating to observe, they do not provide the energy life on Earth needs to survive. There you go. Don't expect to see the color of the sky in space. When you look at photos taken from spaceships, or the International Space Station that show sunlit objects like Earth or the Moon, something seems wrong. Space looks too empty. No magical scenery of a nighttime sky full of stars. It would be incredibly boring to go stargazing in space, since the sky is always dark. During the daytime, the sky on our home planet is blue because of the diffusion of light. It happens when sunlight goes through the atmosphere. But if you were on the moon or somewhere else in space, there would be no atmosphere to spread this light around. That's why the sky there would always appear black. But it doesn't mean less bright out there. If you were looking out the window of the space station, you'd see just as much direct sunlight as you would gazing out of your apartment window during a cloudless day. Maybe even more. 
When taking a picture on a sunny day, you'll probably use a short exposure together with the narrow aperture setting on your camera. This way, just a short burst of light will get in. That's similar to how our pupils contract in sunlight so that they don't have to deal with too much light. And since it's just as bright up there in space, the process is the same when you take pictures of sunlit objects there. Using short exposure, you can get good, bright pictures of Earth or the surface of the moon. But it also means there will be no stars in the picture. Even up there, stars are relatively dim. They don't emit enough light to show up in photos taken with such settings. Our home planet has a blue sky that slowly transforms into a beautiful orange-red palette at dusk and dawn. But if you ever get a chance to watch a sunset on Mars, you should expect the opposite, an orange-brown daytime sky that gets a bluish tint at sunset. First of all, Mars is farther away from the sun than our planet. So, when you're looking at the sun from the Martian surface, of course, it looks fainter and smaller. And not just that. The sun observed from Mars is just a bluish-white dot surrounded by a blue halo. The thin atmosphere of the red planet contains large dust particles. They create an effect called my scattering. It occurs when the diameter of particles in the atmosphere is almost the same as the wavelength of the scattered light. This effect filters out the red light from the sun's rays. So, only the blue light would reach your eyes on Mars. How come Earth doesn't have rings? All gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have such rings, whereas the rocky planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars don't. There are two theories about how rings can appear around a planet. They might be just some material left from the times when the planet was forming, or they may be the remains of a moon that got destroyed by a collision with some space body, or torn apart by the strong gravitational pull of its parent planet. The gas giants formed in the outer regions of our solar system, while all the rocky planets are in the inner part. So maybe the inner planets were more protected from potential collisions that could have formed their rings. There are also more moons in the outer regions of our solar system, which could be another reason why the planets there have rings. Also, bigger planets have stronger gravity. It means that they can keep their rings stable after they form. Some experts believe Earth used to have a ring system a long time ago. A Mars-sized object might have collided with our home planet, which probably created a dense ring of debris around it. Some scientists think that this debris formed not a ring, but what we know today as the Moon. There's probably a giant planet lurking at the edge of the solar system, far beyond Neptune. Scientists call this mysterious hypothetical world Planet 9. If it does exist, it's probably similar to Uranus or Neptune, and 10 times more massive than our home planet. It's likely to circle around the Sun, but in the outer reaches of the solar system, about 20 times farther than Neptune. Another interesting theory says that Planet 9 could actually be a black hole the size of a grapefruit that warps space in a similar way a large planet would. Even though we once thought it was a rare substance in space, water exists all over our solar system. For example, you can often find it in asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on the Moon and Mercury. We still don't know if there's enough water to support potential human colonies if we decide to move there, but some amount of water is definitely present there. Mars has water at its poles too. It's mostly hidden in the layers of ice and probably under the planet's dusty surface. Europa, Jupiter's moon, has some water too. This is the most likely candidate we know about to host life outside Earth. There's probably a whole ocean of liquid water under its frozen surface it might actually contain twice as much water as all of Earth's oceans combined. Neptune is unexpectedly warm. Even though it's 30 times as far from the Sun as our planet and receives less sunlight and heat, but it still radiates way more heat than it gets. It also has way more activity in its atmosphere than you'd suspect, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Both of these planets emit the same amount of heat, even though Uranus is much closer to the Sun. No one knows why. Neptune has extremely strong winds that can reach a speed of up to 1,500 miles per hour. Can they produce this heat? Or maybe it's because of the planet's core or its gravitational force? 
there's a monster black hole hurtling through space at a speed of 5 million miles per hour. Scientists located it with the Hubble Space Telescope. They believe it weighs as much as a billion suns. It was supposed to stay put in the center of its home galaxy, but some gravitational forces are pushing it around. At one point, this black hole is going to break free from its galaxy and continue roaming the universe. Luckily, it's still 8 billion years away from us. Solar storms are so powerful that they could leave us in complete darkness. Back in July 2012, the strongest solar storm in over 150 years narrowly missed Earth. Coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, are large bubbles of ionized gas. They tore through our orbit back then. If they had caught our planet in the crosshairs, we would have literally been in the firing line. We'd have faced solar matter hurtling towards Earth, damaging computers and causing power outages that would have lasted for months. A surprise solar storm hit us on June 25, 2022. One photographer even managed to capture stunning bright auroras that flashed across the dawn sky in Calgary, Canada, and lasted for five minutes. They were caused by the storm. Vampire stars are a real thing. They're part of a binary star, and they can literally drain the life out of the other star in the system. They do it to keep burning for a longer time. It works like this. A smaller star with a lower mass steals its sibling's hydrogen fuel to increase its own mass. This vampire star then becomes hotter. Plus, its color changes to striking blue. This way, it looks much younger. How sneaky! The color of the universe is dubbed Cosmic Latte. The light coming from our galaxies and stars within them, as well as clouds of gas and dust in the observable universe, have a specific color. It's an ivory tint, pretty close to white. The universe is beige because there are a bit more areas that produce green, yellow, and red light than those that emit blue. The profession of an astronaut is probably one of the most intriguing and mysterious out there. But have you ever wondered about the details of their everyday life? Like what's going on under those bulky spacesuits? I mean, some people seriously believe that astronauts wear paper underwear. Others are sure that a lack of gravity allows the grime to just float away. If only. The thing is, astronauts don't do laundry at all. In 2011, NASA commissioned a washing machine for the International Space Station. Was it a joke? In any case, astronauts couldn't use it for apparent reasons. Delivering water to the ISS just to do laundry sounds outrageous and super costly. So, astronauts can only dream of freshly laundered linens and other stuff. Instead, fresh clothes get delivered to the station from Earth just like any other supplies. Unfortunately, it happens not that often since the price of launching literally anything into space is exorbitant. So, astronauts have to wear their clothes for way longer than they would otherwise do on Earth. The only thing that makes this situation a bit better is that astronauts tend to lose some of their sense of smell in space. When interviewed, some astronauts admitted wearing, for example, the same pair of shorts for months and only changing their underwear once every three or four days. It's probably not surprising that astronauts dress not to impress, but for comfort and convenience. Their typical attire usually consists of short-sleeved shirts and long cargo pants. Those are regular clothes we wear on Earth, nothing special. But when they leave the climate-controlled insides of the ISS, of course, they need special clothes. By that, I mean those very chunky spacesuits. They protect astronauts from insane temperature swings ranging from 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the sun to minus 250 degrees in the shade. But even with all this protection and cooling tubes wicking away body heat, spacewalks tend to cause astronauts to work up a sweat. Wearing an EVA, which stands for extravehicular activities, can mean hours of hard work. And don't forget that astronauts often wear layers to stay warm and pressurized. And these layers include an inner form-fitting item of clothing that resembles long underwear. This item is often reworn and even shared. And since there are no washing machines on the ISS, you get the point, right? An interesting fact, there is a specially trained person who smells every single thing that astronauts take with them into space. It's done to protect them from unpleasant or toxic odors. 
The thing is that you can't really air the room out there in space if you don't like how it smells inside. That's why NASA is very careful about what kind of odors can pass through. At the same time, nothing can prevent the smells that appear already on the ISS. Anyway, spacesuits and what's underneath them are used again and again. And soon you start worrying not only about bad smells, but also about hygiene and health problems. An alarming possibility of biocontamination arises. It includes bacteria, body fluids, and other foreign substances. It gets worse if we think about longer missions. For instance, to the moon. At the same time, it's totally impractical to wash spacesuit interiors on a consistent basis. Water is too valuable on the ISS to waste it on something so mundane. That's why NASA, along with the European Space Agency and other organizations, asked specialists to develop fabrics that could solve the problem of biocontamination in suits. You see, during the shuttle program conducted by NASA, spacesuits were supposed to be used on quite short two-week trips. But then, astronauts started living on the ISS for much longer periods of time. That's why the spacesuit's lifespan had to be extended up to six years. No wonder microbes became a much more worrying issue than before. So more than a decade ago, a team of experts began to research different methods of getting rid of microbes and bacteria dwelling in spacesuits. They cut textiles in two-inch squares and put them in petri dishes and grew a few species of fungi and bacteria on these samples. Some of the fabrics they used were infused with copper. This substance has impressive antimicrobial properties. When bacteria touch this element, their cell walls and membranes get destabilized. The metal's ions damage microbes, making them more vulnerable. NASA scientists also tried using textiles treated with silicon and silver. The latter turned out to be as toxic to germs on contact as copper. After observing the stuff that had grown on the fabrics for the past 14 days, the researchers discovered that only one compound had managed to keep bacteria and fungi at bay. It was a solution of silver molecules normally used for disinfecting hospital dressings and other stuff. But the ions of this metal turned out to be too good at their job because they got rid of everything, literally. And total sterility could do more harm than good. We need a balanced ecosystem consisting of millions of microorganisms to keep our organs and skin healthy. In 2022, NASA hired U.S. companies Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace to develop the next generation of spacesuits. And soon, a prototype suit appeared. It was designed to be used during the Artemis III mission. The main goal of this voyage is to land a crew at the south pole of our natural satellite. These spacesuits are supposed to use textiles with antimicrobial properties that can potentially reduce biocontamination. The cooling system of these suits will also add biocides in its water loops, which will help prevent microbial buildup. Now let's talk about spacesuits in more detail. To begin with, there are actually two main types of spacesuits. You've probably seen the Advanced Crew Escape Suit, aka the Orange Suit, aka the Pumpkin Suit. Astronauts wear this full-pressure suit during takeoff, or rather liftoff, since we're talking about a spaceship. These suits are irreplaceable for those who are heading for super high altitudes. There, the pressure is so low that people can't survive without a special protective suit. And while air crews wear partial pressure suits, space crews have to be protected by full pressure suits. After all, they travel way, way higher. The suit is also equipped with lots of things that can help an astronaut survive emergencies during a spaceship launch or landing. A regular pumpkin suit is stocked with flares, medications, survival gear, a radio, and a parachute. So, in short, astronauts couldn't live through the process of leaving Earth without the orange suit. But why did its designers choose this hue? The main reason for picking the orange color is that this hue is one of the most visible for search and rescue, including very probable sea rescue. As for EVAs, their purpose is different. Astronauts wear these suits when they set off on spacewalks. It can protect them from the severe conditions of outer space, with its extreme temperatures and near vacuum. Plus, the spacesuit can prevent small debris from hurting space travelers. You've probably noticed that EVA suits are much bulkier than the orange ones. That's because they have many layers of insulation and heavy protective fabric. 
They also contain breathable air, drinkable water, and temperature controls. Now, every time an astronaut goes on a spacewalk, they use a tether that ties them to the space station. And in case the tether breaks, the EVA suit has a backup system. This system includes small jet thrusters which can be controlled from the station with the help of a joystick. As for the color, first of all, white reflects the heat of the sun better than other colors, and astronauts don't get too hot. Plus, the white color is the best when it comes to spotting the tiny dot of an astronaut against the vast expanse of black space. Another curious detail. While white spacesuits protect astronauts from getting too hot, they can't prevent them from getting too cold. And that's when special gloves come into play. They have special heaters which keep astronauts' fingers cozy and functioning. Many people would like to fly into space. Zero gravity, a stunning view of Earth from one side, and the boundlessly frightening black area from the other. Yeah, it's all cool. But don't forget that this journey can turn into a nightmare. Lack of oxygen, floating in outer space and staying in a spaceship for a long time without understanding when you can return home. This last thing happened to a Russian cosmonaut. His stay in space is one of the longest in the world. 33-year-old flight engineer Sergei Krikalev spent 311 days in zero gravity on the Mir space station. But that's not the most interesting part of this story. Sergei's long journey began on May 18, 1991. That day, he boarded a transport ship and went into space to the Mir space station. On May 20th, the docking with the station was completed. There, together with another engineer, Sergei performed his space duties. They went on spacewalks several times, did repairs, took care of the station, and conducted scientific experiments. When you have company and a lot of work, living in space is not so hard. But things got worse on the day when Sergei was supposed to return home. According to the plan, the mission should have lasted for five months. A new astronaut was supposed to replace the old ones. The transport ship had finally docked with the station. But on October 10th, only one astronaut returned to Earth. Sergei was left alone at the Mir station. He continued to work as the sole flight engineer of the crew. The station couldn't remain empty. They had to send someone to replace Sergei. He wasn't ready for such a long stay in space. He hadn't trained for it. But there was no choice. He couldn't just leave the station. One month passed. They informed Sergei that he would return home soon, but something happened that no one expected. They contacted Sergei and said he couldn't return, since the country that promised to bring him home no longer existed. During this time, a big crisis began in Russia. The cosmonauts' return was impossible, since no one had the money for it. Just imagine Sergei's condition. You are hundreds of miles from home, in black outer space, completely alone, and have no idea how many days you have left to be there. The days passed slowly, weeks, then a month passed. It would have been much easier if being in space was not harmful to your health. But in conditions of zero gravity, the human body takes serious damage. First, it's a weakening of the muscles. The body doesn't receive the necessary load it needs, and the muscles are constantly in a relaxed state leading to dystrophy. Yes, astronauts do a set of exercises every day, but this is not enough to keep the body in shape. In addition to muscles, bones begin to weaken and a person becomes weak. Even after six months of such a life, any astronaut needs a long time to get back into their previous shape after returning home. Also, there's a lot of radiation in space, which is dangerous for people. It comes from several sources at once. The main radiation comes from the sun, on Earth, we're protected from it, thanks to the planet's magnetic field. Almost all radiation accumulates in the upper atmosphere and doesn't reach us. This accumulation of radiation in the atmosphere is also bad for astronauts. But the worst radiation is the galactic one. It comes from distant stars and galaxies and has a powerful effect on all living things. Radiation provokes many unfavorable conditions and destroys the body at the cellular level. Now. All spaceships and the ISS are equipped with shields and coatings that reflect radiation. But still, it doesn't provide 100% protection. In space, the astronaut's immune system changes. There are no conditions under which immunity could improve. It seems that there's nothing wrong with the absence of many bacteria and microbes. But the body's defense is weakening. 
a person becomes more vulnerable to microbes that can be brought by another astronaut. You also have serious food restrictions. Food in tubes doesn't contain as many useful vitamins as it does in natural products. Without vitamins, the body weakens even more. And sometimes, astronauts have to go on spacewalks, which aren't easy. A spacesuit is a huge and uncomfortable outfit. It constrains your movements and puts pressure on your body. Work in space can last up to several hours. During this time, you sweat a lot. One of the suit's filters may be broken, and all the fluid released by your body can spread throughout the suit and reach your face. Your eyes may water. The drops could interfere with your vision. Thousands of dangers can await an astronaut during a mission in outer space. Imagine that you do some repairs and something goes wrong. The wrench jumps off the bolt and it flies out, for example. You try to catch it and unconsciously push off from the ship. You catch the bolt, but your body is already flying away. You have nothing to hold on to. But fortunately, you have a safety rope. Anyway, it can break off from your spacesuit because you attached it incorrectly. As soon as the rope breaks, your body changes the angle of flight. Now you're not just flying away, your body is spinning at this moment. The earth and black space flash in your eyes. So you get it. There are definitely risks, but nothing like that happened with Sergei. All astronauts spend many hours training to be ready for any troubles. They gain good physical shape and lose it during the mission. Add to this the psychological factor. Your body weakens, you don't breathe fresh air, you can't see your friends, and you don't have the opportunity to return home. A small layer of wall separates you from the cold vacuum of space. All this causes stress, which also weakens your immunity and harms your nervous system. Fortunately, astronauts also get through serious psychological training. They can maintain self-control in the most stressful situations. But when you're alone in space for more than six months and don't know when you'll return, you can get seriously nervous. Fortunately, Sergei didn't panic. He performed his daily duties, trained, and of course, missed home. A month later, he received the same response. We can't bring you back yet. The country is in a difficult situation. He felt worse every day. His strength was leaving him. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to survive. The most interesting thing is the station had a capsule developed to return to Earth. But Sergei didn't use it, because no one would have served the station. Russia sold the station seats to other countries. Also, they hoped to sell Mir. This meant that Sergei had to keep the station working. Sergei's mission lasted twice as long as planned. As a result, he spent 10 months, or 311 days, in space and set a world record. During this time, he flew around the Earth about 5,000 times. Finally, he received the long-awaited message. He's coming home. Germany paid about $24 million for a ticket to the station. They were going to replace the astronaut. Krikalev got into the capsule and flew to Earth. Many people were waiting for his return down there. The cosmonaut landed and everyone rushed to help him. He looked very thin, sweaty, and exhausted. Four men helped him out of the capsule. They helped him stay on the ground, gave him a fur coat, and brought a bowl of broth. It seemed that such a flight would leave an imprint on his life forever. But the cosmonaut's mood was excellent. Two years later, he went into space again and became the first Russian cosmonaut to fly on a NASA shuttle. And two years later, he was one of the first to live on the ISS. In 2005, he made his sixth and last flight. He went to the ISS, where he spent about six months, after which he returned home on the lander. After this flight, he set a world record for the total duration of stay in space at 803 days. Only 10 years later, someone managed to break that record. But that's a different story. Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. 
Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too, and those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. May be a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system, and there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object. Which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms: closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here. Even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us, the moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy objects store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways: convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight. The sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. 
We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut though if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, 
Is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions, like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface, but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse, and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So, you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe, and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now imagine living like that for six months, or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. 
Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them, and some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds. But this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds. 
basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the Moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the Moon. The side that we never see because the Moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. 
They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So, let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Venus most likely used to be covered with oceans, from 30 to 1,000 feet deep. Also, some water was locked in the soil of the planet. On top of that, Venus had stable temperatures of 68 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which, you have to admit, was quite pleasant and not that different from the temperatures on Earth nowadays. So, what I'm getting at is that for 3 billion years, right until something irrevocable happened 700 million years ago, Venus could have been habitable. But now, it's not. The Moon is the second brightest object in our sky. At the same time, among other astronomical bodies, it's one of the dimmest and least reflective. Our natural satellite only seems bright because it's so close to Earth. For comparison, our planet looks much brighter when you look at it from space. It's because clouds, ice, and snow reflect way more light than most types of rock. Triton, Neptune's moon, has all its surface covered with several layers of ice. If this satellite replaced our current moon, the night sky would get seven times brighter. Neutron stars are some of the smallest, yet most massive objects in space. They're usually about 12 miles in diameter, but are several times heavier than the sun. Oh, and they also spin about 600 times per second, far faster than your average figure skater. Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It has one-eighth the average Earth's density. And still, because of its large volume, the planet is 95 times more massive than Earth. A transient lunar phenomenon is one of the most enigmatic things happening on the Moon. It's a short-lived light, color, or some other change on the satellite surface. Most commonly, it's random flashes of light. Astronomers have been observing this phenomenon since the 1950s. They've noticed that the flashes occur randomly. Sometimes they can happen several times a week. After that, they disappear for several months. Some of them don't last longer than a couple of minutes. But there have been those that continued for hours. The year was 1969, one day before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. One of the mission participants noticed that one part of the lunar surface was more illuminated than the surrounding landscape. It looked as if that area had a kind of fluorescence to it. Unfortunately, it's still unclear if this phenomenon was connected with the mysterious lunar flashes. Trash isn't just a problem in Earth's oceans, cities, and forests. There is a thing called space junk, which is any human-made object that's been left in space and now serves no purpose. There's also natural debris from meteoroids and other cosmic objects. There are currently over 500,000 pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth at speeds high enough to cause significant damage if they were to collide with a spacecraft or satellite. NASA does its best to track every single object to ensure that missions outside Earth can reach their destination safely. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. The Sun's temperature is hotter than the surface of a star. The surface temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. If someone could dig a tunnel straight into the center of the planet and out the opposite side, and you were adventurous enough to jump into it, it would take you 42 minutes to fall to the other side. You'd speed up as you fell, reaching maximum speed by the time you reached Earth's core. After the halfway point, you would then fall upwards, getting slower and slower. 
By the time you reach the opposite surface, your speed would be back to zero. Unless you manage to climb out of the hole, you'd immediately start falling again, back down or up to the other side of the planet. This trip would go on forever, all thanks to the weird effects of gravity. Hey, might be a fun way to spend an afternoon. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the Moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the Moon's? It might mean the Moon was formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. Or maybe, as they've been saying for centuries, it's made of green cheese. Earth could have been purple before it turned blue and green. One scientist has a theory that a substance existed in ancient microbes before chlorophyll, that thing that makes plants green, evolved on Earth. This substance reflected sunlight in red and violet colors, which combined to make purple. If true, the young Earth may have been teeming with strange purple-colored critters before all the green stuff appeared. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest, the Earth's highest mountain above sea level. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't understand you were standing on a mountain. Its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. Astronomers have found a massive reservoir of water in space, the largest ever detected. Too bad it's also the farthest, 12 billion light years away from us. The water vapor cloud holds 140 trillion times as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. What are we supposed to do with that information? Venus spins at its own unhurried pace. A full rotation takes 243 Earth days, and it takes the planet a bit less than 225 Earth days to go all the way around the Sun. It means a day on Venus is longer than a year. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the Moon. Yet many moonquakes, caused by our planet's gravitational pull, sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fissures appear in the satellite surface, and gases escape through them. Hey, they sometimes escape from me, too. Now Mars is the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rocks and metals. The red planet has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur is between 900 and 1,200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 1 100th percent of the Earth's. When the planets in the solar system were just starting to form, Earth didn't have a moon for the longest time. It took 100 million years for our natural satellite to appear. There are several theories as to how the moon came into existence, but the prevailing one is the fission theory. Somebody went fishing and caught the moon? Actually, no. The fission theory proposes that the moon was formed when an object collided with Earth, sending particles flying about. Gravity pulled the particles together, and the moon was created. It eventually settled down on the Earth's ecliptic plane, which is the path that the moon orbits. So, looks like the green cheese is off the table now. The largest single living thing on Earth turns out to be a mushroom in Oregon. This enormous honey mushroom lives in Malheur National Forest and covers an area of 3.7 square miles. It could be as much as 8,500 years old. You could be forgiven for missing it, though, since most of it's hidden underground. When the roots of individual honey mushrooms meet, they can fuse together to become a single fungus, which explains how this one got so big. If you could gather all that mushrooming stuff into one big ball, it could weigh as much as 35,000 tons. That's about as heavy as 200 gray whales. Hey, that's a whale of a mushroom. <laughs> the largest asteroid in the solar system is called Vesta, and it's so big that it's sometimes even called a dwarf planet. A trip to the nearest star apart from the sun would take you 5 million years on a commercial airplane. That's what I call a long-haul flight. Space isn't supposed to be black. There are stars everywhere. 
Shouldn't they light up everything around? Well, you don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Now, some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a small celestial body about 750 miles wide orbited Earth like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Or it could be the green cheese. At a distance of 640 light-years from the sun, scientists discovered planet WASP-76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its sun and always turned to it in the same side. The term is tidally locked. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough so that metals condense again and fall down as rain. Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the Sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. Hmm, figures. A recent study claims that the moon has a tail, and every month it wraps around our planet like a scarf. A slender tail made up of millions of atoms of sodium follows Earth's natural satellite and our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. You won't believe it, but the moon seems to be shrinking. Earth's natural satellite is now 150 feet smaller than it used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. The reason for this phenomenon might be the cooling of the moon's insides. It could also explain the quakes shaking the surface of our planet's natural satellite. Astronomers have recently found out that Mars is seismically active. Mars quakes occur there on a regular basis. For several days every month, the Moon remains between the Sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks up that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But on those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the Moon's full diameter. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that, underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on such planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every nine hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests that there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry, there's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees. That's hot enough to melt some metals. As for vacations there, I'll pass. 
In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that we could fill all our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans thousands of times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there might just be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of its star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only habitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. And get this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. The biggest explosion since the Big Bang was registered in 2019. This happened in the Ophiuchus Cluster, which unites thousands of galaxies. According to scientists, the blast was equal to 20 billion billion that's 18 zeros, megaton explosions happening once a millisecond for 240 million years. Um, I'll have to trust that. My math is not that good. In 2019, NASA's InSight lander, whose goal was to study the interior of Mars, registered the first Mars quake ever. These quakes were coming fast, about two per day. Most of them were tiny. You wouldn't even feel them if they happened on our planet. So far, more than 300 Mars quakes have been detected. Those are the first quakes on any space body other than Earth and the Moon. Another mysterious phenomenon discovered by the mission was bizarre magnetic pulses. They occurred every midnight around the lander. It's still unclear what those pulses were. Maybe after midnight, they're going to let it all hang out, or something. Pluto's atmosphere rises much higher above the surface of the dwarf planet than, let's say, Earth's. It also has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. Remember the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth? Hey, I wasn't around then, but who could forget? There might have been another space show that ended badly for at least 75% of all life on our planet in the past. Roughly 360 million years ago, a supernova explosion occurred about 65 light years away from us, and the cosmic rays sent by it swept away the ozone layer of our pretty blue ball. Wow, tough neighborhood. Now imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So, somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. 
And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. It presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super-extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region, especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the red planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaur's demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its north pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. 
This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! But this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like, in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.